Yes, from we, we graduated the same year. Growing up with, uh, I grew up with a lot of protocols, mm -hmm. orthopedic protocols, treatment protocols, um, and like I say, reading uh, research papers and just the the application of them not always being immediately obvious. How do you find that you individualise patient care based on research? Yeah. Have you got any tips for anyone who does read papers? Or? Um, it is a genuine interest of mine, though, to, to be more individualised in terms of treatment. And um, and I think that I, I think that you I've described physio in the past as pendular. You know, yeah. you swing into something in favour and then out again. Big manual therapy, big exercise therapy, whatever it might be, and that and. Um, that I've always sort of tried to position myself a little bit in the middle of that, whereas you know you take on board and, and never rule something out, but you consider its sort of relative merits to the individual in front of you. So I think exposing yourself, not being too narrow, not sort of thinking that this is the panacea, because I'm pretty convinced that we do not have that. Um, Education is really critical, adjuncts are really critical for some more than others. Mm. Um, you know, sort of. Um, exercise intervention is then critical for some and more yep. so for some rather than others and and I think then you need to expose or, or be open-minded about that the breadth of methodologies of delivering care okay. and then and then and you might find that you spend some time reading around you know, some adjunctive thing and that becomes quite interesting and you sort of you know apply some of that but you don't forget the other bit that you've employed for a long period of time and you still integrate into their care and then you don't think about actually look it's really important how I ask these questions and what information I glean from the patient before I've begun all of that stuff I in see. order to do it you know the patient that I saw just before meeting with yourself one of the biggest discussions I was having with a student who was shadowing was that you know, for him the the most important thing for him to get out of the session was um, was some calibration about what that symptom meant you know see, yeah, that yeah. Was what was the most important thing to him he was fearful about what that symptom meant so we should spend a lot of time educating him on on what that symptom represented and what potentially was was threatening or, or dangerous if you like or harmful and what what wasn't and and that's what sort of shaped so, a lot of the session sort of i think relating it to the patient in front of you with an open-minded uh, perspective yeah seeing what actually matters to that patient and then yeah. somehow teasing out from studies that you've read or research you've been yeah. involved with. Yeah, because you sometimes know. you've got to challenge that view, generally, yeah. you know, and, and, but you've got to go about that in a sensible way yeah. too, because you just tell someone that they're wrong, they're going to throw it back in your face and Absolutely. no one's got anywhere with that. But So you've got to recognise that, oh, this is a healthcare belief that's, you know, extremely unhelpful for this individual. Or, that's what the literature would suggest, or yeah. that you know that that's what the evidence would suggest, and so you know, we've got to challenge that. But we've got to challenge that in an appropriate way that they're not going to just you know sort of throw, throw it back and sort of say, oh well, this guy you know clearly doesn't get me, and I therefore see. I'm off and I'll go and see someone else. So um, yeah, yeah, I think that probably summarises what we're talking about. I think that, okay. but that's that's how I view it. I think you've got to take the literature, you've got to combine that with what's presenting in front of you, and you've got to try and um, tailor that to, to what are their needs, what you think are helpful beliefs in order to help them get better, to offer them some indication of time frames for success and so on. So from your academic work, I think a lot of people think of academia as this kind of cerebral process and you talk about stuff. Do you think it's actually changed how you communicate with patients on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, yeah, I think so. Well, yeah, I think so. In so much as, yeah, what would be the answer? I'd, I'd say yes because I, I feel like I've got more information to disseminate. Oh, I see. But I'm very, very conscious that there's only a certain amount that some people can take on board, and there's only yeah. a certain amount that's helpful and what's not. So, um, I've definitely gained knowledge, without a doubt, from like doing this process, from learning how to write papers myself, how to conduct studies, what the limitations are of studies, etc. I've, I've gained knowledge, but it's taking time and it will continue to take time for me to be able to take that what is quite hard science knowledge mm -hmm. and translate that into something that's meaningful for that individual yeah. funds.
And um, it, it, like you were saying to that student who you were talking about, I think some people just have a natural gift for communicating with patients anyway, you know. And it's always <laughs> this question about how how you best improve your communication skills with patients. Yeah. But it's interesting that you you feel sort of from yeah from increasing your own knowledge base, you you can reflect on it yourself and perhaps improve your your consultation style. Mm. And that I mean that's yeah, definitely a positive aspect of yeah. academic clinical practice. You know, if, if that really is the case, isn't it? The two things aren't detached, and you can actually improve as a sort of a clinician who sees patients on a day-to-day basis. Oh uh, yeah, I, I'd say so. Yeah, but I do think, like I, I don't know whether other people think this as well, and whether this is common health belief. But my, I genuinely, um, I genuinely think that communication is is a is a skill in itself, yeah. and it's something that we've got to work we've got to work really hard at, and some people yeah. I think have to work harder at it than others mm-hmm. to get it to get it right and to be able to relay these really important messages to be able to pick up on you know communication being sort of verbal non-verbal etc you know being able to pick up on when you're challenging something a little bit too much and they're not okay. they're not getting it and yeah. that's up that subtle side of communication and and you know even how we're communicating them as we're asking them to do stuff or teaching them things or or positioning them in certain ways and educating them about what this adjunctive treatment is all about and how that fits within your your treatment paradigm that you're looking to deliver and what, what again drawing back on the evidence would suggest is probably what we need to be doing in order to get you better or get you that bit better still yeah yeah so i i know in um an area such as psychology at the moment there's this idea of a replication crisis where a lot of the studies that were done several years ago uh, researchers and present researchers are finding quite difficult to replicate the results right. and you know large chunks of uh, general principles and understanding are starting to be shifted mm. and replaced what do you think is practiced in physio at the moment that won't be replicated in the future <laughs> I don't know, let me get out my crystal ball. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, sometimes you, new yeah. things come along and you're saying there's this idea of a pendulum swing and I do see some, something else comes along and everyone jumps on board this bandwagon and then we're on the next thing. And sometimes if you take a step back, I think you can sort of see that something's not working yeah. without even reading research. Yeah. Um, and is there anything like that at the moment that you get a feeling that, uh, that is happening? Um, I, I think you could almost make a claim, though, that everything is potentially having an effect in some way and whether yeah. that's placebo because okay. we're delivering it or whatever I, I almost don't think that there's anything that um, that will never be used again yeah. and that people will kind of look like, oh, like what a dark thing I think certain things will, will hopefully be proven less effective and more effective by good scientific rigour because they're they're able to better extrapolate whether that is just a solely placebo effect or whether actually that's placebo plus and 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 the like. And, and one of the big priorities of our research and our research group at QM is is looking at mechanisms, is to try yeah. and understand how this stuff is having an effect. Because like if it is placebo and that's its sole effect, but it's having you know the placebo effect of that intervention is far superior than the placebo effect of something else. Then obviously like that's that's fine. It's still significant but, yeah, for the patient. But, but hopefully what we'll see is that both have good placebo effects, but this actually has some sort of you know mechanism of effect that we really understand, which is that you know, it changes some kinematics or it changes some strength or it changes, you know, something else, tissues tolerance to load on a on a structured sort of level. And the two then can combine, or that you know, that that exercise has a profound um, sort of effect in terms of, sort of cerebrally because of the endorphin release etc and we really understand that mechanism and, and therefore the reason that I'm applying that intervention is for that effect and then it's and then it's sort of a reasoned effect for doing it you know rather than kind of sort of saying oh I'm doing this because you know, I think it could be affected but I don't really know through what mechanism it's having in its effect you know and hopefully then sort of going back to your point about tailored intervention if we understand the mechanism of effect better we can target that so if if somebody's come in and they're we've we've just decided that their primary driver of their symptoms is is sort of pain mechanisms or psychology or sensitization something like that and we think right well intervening in a way that's going to increase endorphin release and and sort of suppress some of that sensitization is positive then we understand the mechanism of this intervention to do that so therefore we'll give you that intervention but 
if for, for another person their primary driver is is biomechanical then you know sort of giving them something else that doesn't maybe have as profound effect on on that sort of central mechanism if you like and, and has more of an effect on their biomechanical mechanism then that's going to be more appropriate for that individual and yeah. and and so on and I'm, there's overlay don't get me wrong you know yeah, it's not like you're going to just have one camp and the other but but I, I do believe that there's a primary driver in almost everything for every individual and, and that's, in my opinion, the one that we want to go after first because that's most likely to have the most profound effect and then we deal with the other ones secondary. Okay. Yeah. It's really interesting. So I view it. Yeah. <laughs> so you, yeah, you talked about individualising treatment and we talked about that briefly before. Um, in the research, a lot of the exercise-based interventions are extremely prescriptive for obviously mm -hmm. methodological reasons. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, you need to do this number of exercises uh, with this number of sets, this amount of time of detention, rest between yeah. of this amount of time, you know, and this frequency. And, and how prescriptive are you sort of day to day in the real world with patients? And, and how much do you think they stick to these rigid plans? I try to be clear and precise. I, I really do because I. I the, the literature that I've read around this is, is that um, the, the sort of more precise we can be, the, the better the physiological effect that we can expect. Absolutely. So, so I do think there's a need for precision. Mm -hmm. I keep it, I do try to keep it simple for that very reason. So I will seldom give someone more than three exercises when we first start out, if that's what I'm thinking we're going to do in terms of you know, rehabilitative sort of package or, or that's what I'm going to prescribe. Um, given three things, I try to be as clear as I possibly can about frequency and then I offer a lot of explanation as to why. Like, yeah. What is it that we're trying to affect by doing this? Why is it critical that you do this five days in seven rather than three days in seven? And actually this has become a real um, sort of a bias, I suppose, of my research is to try and understand how critical this dose is. because. A lot of it is theoretical paradigms at the moment. Uh, there's some strength and conditioning literature that sort of would indicate that that induces it, but from a, from a treating patient perspective, in individuals with pain, our understanding of that isn't, isn't where I think it needs to be at, considering that's our go-to intervention in yeah, a lot of cases. Yeah. So um, I, I think we need to understand better if we're delivering a neuromuscular intervention like what is that effect that that's having and what's the mechanism through which it's having that effect as we talked about and then you know do we then need to go on to strength do we need to go on to strength endurance do we need to go on to deliver power in order for that individual to be you know rehabbed effectively and, and comprehensively so i do think it's critical that we are specific and i, I think we have to be clear and this comes back to our communication mm. thing we've got yeah. to be very you know very very sort of um relaying the message in a way in which they get, they understand, and they understand why they're doing it. And I, I do think that they're far more compliant on that when the explanation has gone well. And I'm not saying I do it all the time and achieve that, which would be great, but when I feel like I have explained it well, offered sound rationale that is relates to that individual, they've bought on board and they've, and they've done it. 